New polling data is in. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Oh, it's just a busy Tuesday. There's a lot going on here. We've got our uh, standout pollster, Joe Fleming, in along with the guy that actually now helps craft the questions. Not only report on it, Ted Nisi, uh, to talk about the governor's poll and the Senate poll. So I want to get right into it. Just got on my phone that uh, Whitey Bulger may have left uh, the planet. Uh, 89 years of age, uh, various reports. We'll have to talk about that tomorrow. I got nothing confirmed other than it may not have gone well in this new prison. Well, obviously, you know, one way or the other, but holy cow. Um, I would stay tuned to Channel 12 and Fox 64. Tim White understands these issues better than anybody. I'm sure he'll be on this uh, lickety split. Uh, last night, before we get into the polling data, vigil in Providence. Of course, the president, as we tape, is reportedly en route to Pittsburgh. Uh, some people are saying, please don't come, which doesn't help with the acrimonious atmosphere that we have in this country. But um, a pretty moving vigil last night. It began with a moment of silence. After dark moments hit our country Saturday, 11 lives tragically taken after police say a man opened fire inside the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. If you've got a heart, it has to hurt you. A clear message is being shared by local religious leaders. When you attack a community of faith, the pain doesn't stop at that city, state, or even nation. It's felt worldwide by those who believe in a higher power. And for those reasons, hundreds come together for a vigil right here in Providence. Some compared hatred to a fast spreading fire, one that can easily be defeated by loving one another. Eleven candles honoring the victims are displayed here to remind us. Look at everyone here bearing light. This is how we combat hate. Local rabbis asked the crowd to continue doing the exact thing those 11 people were trying to do when they were killed. May we find the strength to take action to repair our world. And to just do your part for the owner of the Shalom Memorial Chapel in Cranston, that means making the trip to Pittsburgh to help with those funerals. Um, I already talked to uh, my cohort down there, uh, funeral director, and she needs the help. She's overwhelmed, and I can understand that. Oh, let me tell you something. It was really a very moving ceremony. There were two things, well, three things. Uh, the, the presentation, the prayerfulness of it, the silence of a crowd, which was many hundreds, if not a thousand. Um, I stood amidst them to just get a feel for how this whole thing was. And I will tell you, you could hear a pin drop with all of the very, very uh, solemn prayers offered, both in English and in Hebrew. Uh, a second observation, and I thought this was perfect, although there was a serious delegation of elected officials, including all of our federal um, officials and uh, the governor, uh, none of them spoke, which I thought was the right touch. There was no political aspect to this other than the Reverend Donnie Anderson from the Council of Churches, who did a little bit of an NRA thing in the middle of his theological presentation, which caused this guy Gordon, the AG candidate, who was very calm here, but lost his mind in North Kingstown. He jumped up and screamed about how he was a Jew and how he was offended by it. It did have a little bit of a uh, tone to it, but other than, uh, and then he was quickly just kind of escorted out. Uh, other than that, this was a beautiful ceremony, quickly put together uh, by a community of people who really needed to be together. It was it was quite touching. Uh, your, your prayers uh, continue, I'm sure, as, as mine do, uh, for those victims. All righty, to uh, the story of the day, before we get to the polls, look at this headline. Ted Nisi did some journalistic work here, and this gentleman, Representative Keeble, uh, is now, I don't know, Figuratively, the walking dead in his election, I'm thinking. This is a problem in some ways, I will tell you, that um, people are innocent until they're proven guilty in a court of law. But in politics and in the public court of opinion, of opinion uh, you can, you know. But I will tell you, this has legs. Twelve current and former lawmakers I interviewed tell me Catherine Kazarian's complaints about Kale Keeble were well known in the House. 
Target 12 recently obtained a March 11th email from Representative Catherine Kazarian to Rhode Island's most powerful lawmaker, House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello. Kazarian confirmed the email's authenticity. In it, she shared her concern about how a key committee would handle her legislation, writing, As we have discussed, I have endured years of sexual harassment by House Judiciary Chairperson Kale Keeble. Last year, you did not grant my request to have the bills move to a different committee. Kazarian added, I do not wish to be put in that position again. And she wasn't. We found the video on Capitol TV archives. When that hearing took place in April, Chairman Keeble was present at the start, but within about 15 minutes, he was gone, right as Kazarian sat down to testify. Representative Kazarian. Mattiello confirms he told Keeble not to be present when she arrived. Kazarian declined to discuss Keeble's behavior in detail, but told Target 12, quote, the email speaks for itself, and all I wanted was a fair hearing. Keeble's lawyer has so far declined our request for an interview, but dismissed the claims as, quote, unsubstantiated years-old allegations and pointed out Kazarian never filed a complaint with the Rhode Island Commission for Human Rights. After becoming aware of the sexual harassment allegations Monday, Keeble's law firm placed him on administrative leave until, quote, these allegations are clarified. And within 90 minutes of our first report, Mattiello removed Keeble as chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Mattiello also insists he repeatedly took action in response to Kazarian's concerns. We did reach out to Kale Keeble's lawyer tonight for reaction to this evening's development. So far, we have not heard back. Two candidacies. Mr. Keeble's is in jeopardy, but so too is Mr. Mattiello's. Mr. Fleming, Mr. Nisi, welcome. Um, what's the pollster say about this a week away? Obviously, if you're the uh, two incumbents, not a good situation at all. It's the obvious. I mean, you have to deal with this over the next seven days, six days, and try to basically uh, hold your own and try to explain it the best you can. But you have to address the issue. If you don't address the issue, it's going to really look bad. Is that you talking about the candidate or the speaker? I think both have to address the issue. Well, not so far. Um, the speaker issued a statement to me yesterday. I, he did not. He refused to answer questions in an interview on the record. Um, but he issued a statement, sort of walking through. Uh, arguing, you know, he first became aware of, as he put it, he, he described it as a falling out uh, between the two of them. He did not, uh, it, those are my words, but that's how I would characterize the speaker's statement. And he learned there had been an incident between them in, at, a, at an event in 2015, and he basically told, don't be in the same room together anymore. Uh, don't talk to each other. Um, and then uh, fast forward to 2017, uh, and Kazarian reaches out to the speaker and says, I don't want my bills to be in front of Kale Keeble anymore because of the incidents we've talked about in the past. The speaker says uh, she wanted to move her bills out of judiciary to a different committee, let's say like the education committee, since especially this was about a gun bill in schools. And uh, the speaker said, no, uh, you have to go in front of Keeble's committee, but I'll send uh, my policy advisor, who's a woman, to sit with you while you testify in front of Kale Keeble. Um, and then this year, Kazarian reached, and he says he thought that was that worked out. This year, Kazarian said um, she reached out in, in the email that I obtained, and she said, uh, I, I don't want to have to do what happened last year again. What can we do? And this time, the speaker says he made Keeble leave the room so she could testify without him present. Um, up till at 4 o'clock, before my first story aired at 6, that was last night's 11 o'clock news, um, the speaker was keeping him in, as House Judiciary Chairman and uh, you know, said he'd handled it fine, but then, as, he, as I reported, 90 minutes after that, he told me he was out as House Judiciary Leader. Which happened first? Uh, did his employer take action on him? Correct. Or the speaker did? The, the employer. So I got, uh, I was told by his, he's, he's employed by Partridge, Snow & Hahn, the prestigious law firm, and they reached out to me uh, after they had gotten wind of the, that I was looking into this to say he'd been put on leave uh, while this is looked at. Uh, a week before the election, I don't know you to be loose with, with this stuff. Uh, stories like this are devastating yes. when people are starting to pay attention. You're always Correct. preaching about how they're really paying attention. The last late. two weeks. Yep. Uh, so clearly, you are confident that this is that this. Well, let me ask you: are, are are you confident in your reporting on this that it rises to a higher level than a misunderstanding? I would say, uh, within the confines of what my editors want me to say, uh, we are well aware of the sensitivity of this issue at any time of year, and especially this close to the election. And we also know, we also know that once alleged, the genie back in the bottle, right. from a public opinion and polling point of view, can be, and an electable point of view, can be impossible. Very and, and you know, this has been, as I was saying, this has been 
some some issue has been hanging out there uh, for three and a half years between Kazarian and Keeble. And you know, all I have documented is this email from March, but that's even March is now how many months ago? But there's no specificity on the actions, the events, what Mr. Keeble may have been reported or alleged to have done? Uh, not in the email, and uh, it does not appear there was any investigation conducted in the House to find out if it was credible. Uh, but the email being at somewhat abstract, your own reporting, again... Uh, I did, that's what I said. I talked to 12 other, I should no, say, yeah. No. So it's not just the email. It's, I talked to 12 other reps. I, I don't know. It's so funny. I'm not going to run the tape because we don't have time. I want to get to the polling data and uh, the rest of the intent of the program tonight. Uh, but even on your own Newsmakers debate with Steve Fryas and the Speaker, you asked him questions uh, knowingly, it seems to me now, because you've been working on the story for a while. And uh, he may have flinched once, but he was playing the old, yeah, sometimes things come up. I'm paraphrasing. But yeah, I'm very comfortable with the way I've handled all this kind of stuff. Uh, Avoidance is sometimes not a great strategy, right? Yeah, I mean, obviously the speaker is comfortable with how he handled this. Uh, Kale Keeble's lawyer calls these, quote, unsubstantiated years old allegations. Um, so they, okay. uh, you know, that's, that's where they stand. All right. Um, will it jolt the District 15 election? You know, you got 10,000 voters. You don't know. You had a close election last time. You know, you, if this switches 50 or 60 votes, it could turn the election if it's yeah. that close again. All right. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about the statewide polls. You know, this governor's race, the Senate race, stay with us. <laughs> All right, let me give you the synopsis from Eyewitness News on the latest polling data. 416 likely voters in our exclusive Eyewitness News Roger Williams University poll give incumbent Governor Gina Raimondo an 11-point lead over Republican Alan Fung. Breaking down Raimondo voters, 70% say they are definitely voting for her. 15% say it is unlikely they will change their mind, but 11% say there's a good chance they could change their mind. Most voters are locked in for the governor. I don't see a great deal of her support moving away from her. The same thing can be said with Alan Fung. Fung has slightly stronger support from his voters. 73% say they are definitely voting for him. 16% say they probably won't change their mind. 9% say there is a good chance they could change their mind. It would be very tough at this point. Eyewitness News political analyst and pollster Joe Fleming says for those who pick Republican turned independent Joe Trillo, his support is softer. About 36% of the voters said there's a good chance they could change who they're voting for in the election eight days from now. And there's also another 12% who said they weren't sure what they're going to do. So that is almost half of Joe Trillo's voters that could move away from him. Well, listen, you can't complain about your poll now. He's up two points. <laughs> <laughs> He's gaining ground. He's but, but, up but, in every I don't mean to, to, be, to be snarky. You know, I, I think one of the things that's interesting is that Joe... Um, you know, thought he was coming like a freight train and a go local prov uh, online poll from this Dillavolpe uh, pollster from Harvard had him at 17. Right. He, he argues methodology issues back and forth. Uh, I'd never known you to be that, you're just not that far off. Well, you wouldn't have missed it by 50%. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, the Providence Journal poll had uh, Joe Trillo at 5%. So we're both in the same range. And he screamed Trillo. that that was heavily democratically weighted. I'd also just point out, you know, even if, if we had only done one poll so far, you could say, well, maybe we had a yeah. weird sample. That does happen in polling. Mm -hmm. But this is our fourth well, this year. And you can see the consistency, which tends to make me think it's more credible. Trill was at 6% in February, 6% in July, 7% in September, and now he's at 9%. That actually makes sense, right? Didn't move much early on. Now he's got some no. commercial and stuff, and he's picked up a little bit. Yeah, but the idea that he's going to Bob Healy this thing and race to the low 20s is belied by his high negative rating and right. and the move and, and the fluidity of his support. Even if he does pick up and move up, it's not going to be enough to win the election. Yeah, because you now need you, know? you only needed 41 percent last time to win the election. You right. now need probably. 46 or right. maybe more with how high the governor's The plan. governor's moved their numbers up. It is an unusual race in the sense that I'm asking about the third place guy at 9% <laughs> and we're, we're talking about the mechanics of that, which I understand appears weird to you. Uh, it, appear, it, it feels weird to me. It's been a very strange race. We have a repeat of the Fung Raimondo mm -hmm. uh, contest. The wild card has been Trillo and right. we've all wondered whether or not his wild card would have a major effect on this race and the answer is, in part, yes, yes, but not competitively to win. 
Um, so we almost have to wean ourselves from the focus on Joe Trillo and, 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 and to see what are the dynamics that move the numbers one way or the other for the governor and for the mayor of Cranston, right? It's a strange thing. I mean, Trillo's a 16-year veteran. I mean, he's, right. he's part of the scene. Uh, but it seems like the balloon popped. Yeah, he's getting better known now. More than 70% of the voters know Joe Trillo at this right point. Not the right way. No, but I was going to say, when you look at it, okay, they know him, but now it's in a negative light. Everyone's negatives went up a little bit in this survey, but Joe Trillo's went up a great deal. And I think a lot of that's with the press he's had the last couple of weeks has been all negative for him. So people see him more now as a negative light as they view him. I mean, it goes to show you that the old adage, just spell the name right, is not necessarily true. No. Yeah, correct. I mean, I think there, there is such a thing as bad publicity, and I think Joe Trillo's found it. Uh, in recent weeks, the caulking gun with Matty Yellow. Um, I, I do think, I will say, where I think, I increasingly think, especially after our new poll, that for me, the, the Trillo effect is less about his poll numbers and the votes he gets and more about the mind share he takes up, right? So both the, t the time we're spending talking about him, the time right. the media spent with him, his time he's gotten in the debates, and the time the fun campaign has spent, I'd say more so than the Raimondo campaign, right. to, to right. deal with him. Huge mistake yes. by Alan Fung, engaging in this thing. I told uh, Joe on the radio yesterday, uh, you're too young to remember roller derby. <laughs> but remember when Joni yep. Weston, I think it was Joni Weston, San Francisco Bay Bombers would sling out in front? <laughs> That's Governor Raimondo, right. like pacing yeah. to, to, to go through the jammers. Mm -hmm. And the two other, the two other uh, yep. racers or whatever they were, the runners, are like fighting each other to get into the race. And Fung got tangled okay. up with Trillo. Now, by the way, based on these numbers, though, I guess he might as well just beat the tar out of Trillo to try to get the bulk of his transitional numbers, yeah. right? We, I totally agree. We saw this in the Channel 12 Roger Williams debate with the two of them going out and the governor standing in the middle smiling. She's just standing yeah, up. Yeah, so I mean, if Fung can win all the undecideds and a sizable chunk of Trillo voters, there's a path yeah. for him. The problem is, Nobody uh, does that. That's the thing. You, you, you never narrow. win every vote. that you, Some of no. the people don't vote then. or they, Some people will stay with Joe Trillo. So I think that's where it's getting dicey for, for the Allen Funk. Yeah, 36% of Trillo's voters said they, there's a good chance they could change the mind. Doesn't mean they're going to, but there's a good chance another 12% weren't sure what they're going to do. You don't do. know what change the mind means. It might mean I'm not coming out. Yeah, it absolutely. could. Or, or that I'm not voting. And by the way, we, you know, you see things you don't expect. There could be Trillo race. voters who end up with Raimondo. It sounds unusual, but we know there were Barack Obama 2012 voters who cast a ballot for Donald Trump four years later. People's politics can be surprising, you know? And, and keep in mind, Alan Fung has not really moved his numbers in four years. He got about 36% when he ran for governor four years ago, and all our polls is between 34 and 37%. Mm. It kind of, it kind of, I have offered pl plenty of editorial on this. But I think it speaks for itself. Uh, where's the vision? Where's the, the big time picture? Where's the magnanimity that you expect from a gubernatorial candidate? To her credit, this governor has, you know, she's done what she's done. She's championed what she's done. You may disagree with what she's done. Uh, her competency was a huge issue that he only came into late. Mm. He got tangled up with Trillo. Her competency was the issue that he could have really, really dug in, and I think he just bided too much time. Well, the, the, I do think... We'll talk about this on Wednesday. Yeah, I mean, you I know, do, but I do, I, I th when I look at these numbers, the other thing we haven't talked I think we have, Anita, uh, Alan Funk's favorable rating, and that was very telling to me yes. in the poll, um, which is Alan Funk, here we are. Uh, oh, that's uh, his degree of support, but also we have the rating for how people feel about him. Last time, Alan Fung was at, uh, I want to say, 35% unfavorable. Thank you, Joe. He's now up to 45% unfavorable. So a 10-point swing in Alan Fung's favorable number in just the last In, in part, self-induced pain, but as you would say, the advertising, advertising. dumping on yeah. him. They've been dumping on him for the last month and a half, negative, 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 and his negative number's going up. And they people started, don't like it, they but started it works. immediately. That was the thing that surprised yes. me most with the Fung campaign. I thought, okay, it was looked pretty clear for most of the summer it was going to be a Gina Fung uh, race again, but the Raimondo campaign came out the morning after. They screwed up the ad, so they screwed up a little. But they were ready the morning after the primary to just start to go to war with Fung. And it took a little while for the Fung campaign to ratchet up, which gave an opening, I think, to the governor and her allies in the Democratic Governors and, Association. And the primary really helped the governor, because no one expected her to get 58% of the vote in the primary. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, that gave her momentum coming out of there. And then, as T Ted said, coming right out right the day after the primary with ads and really pushing it well, really listen, kept her momentum. She never moved the, she never moved the needle. She's been in that mid-40 thing the entire, but it's the high 
end of that spectrum. Right. The dam could break. She could be. She could get fifty on election day. Well, I'd also add. I think Joe makes a good point, which is the. Um, the, the primary, and I think a big reason why she did so much better than most people expect in the primary is because of how much time and money they've invested in the ground game yes, field, right. dragging out their voters, getting yep. them to the polls. And don't forget, now she's not going to have to do it alone. She's doing it in, in concert with the very well-funded Sheldon White House campaign. Yeah. Speaking of, <laughs> you know, you never say a race is over, so we'll keep the governor's race at bay. But the other race, it's over. Next. Got a video? So there are the numbers that have not moved an inch from the get-go, and uh, this is this is not a puzzle. But for those who are expecting, and even Sheldon, who was here last night, uh, had this very confident uh, viewpoint. We only have a couple of minutes. I, I'm disappointed in 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 the pollable numbers right now because Sheldon deserved a competitive race just to keep him honest. You know that that athletic phrase, right? But Flanders is a blue chip guy with not a blue chip campaign. First thing is lack of money. He you was could lose never some blue chip stocks that yeah. he could cash in and, and fund his campaign with because I think money's been a big. Sheldon Flanders was popular, but I think I didn't mean to cut you off, Joe. Yep. But just I think you know uh, he's just Fung is not being outspent if, to the degree Flanders is being outspent. This is not even close on ratio, at least for yeah. the six week season for yeah. between the primary right. and the general. And I mean. Right now, Sheldon Whitehouse has a big lead because of three groups. Females, he's up by 31%. Uh, Democrats, he's getting 90% of the Democratic vote. And voters over the age of 60, he's getting 62% of their vote. Those are three key groups well, look, in the state of Rhode Island. Island. Flanders is a, is a very decent and, and accomplished guy. Doesn't want to sell out. I mean, the toughest he got on, on Sheldon was to call him a gas bag in a, in a whatever the hell. Um, not that we needed that in this race, or that Sheldon deserved that, but that's all he wanted to do. Didn't have as much money. Donald Trump is 62% negative, according right. to your numbers here. Yep. Uh, talk about an uphill battle. What Very a race much. he could have run for governor if he wanted that job. You know, I also, I was thinking about this when I looked at the poll because, you know, as a political reporter, I, I want there to be competitive races and I want to be able to have debates with, and that was a great debate, I thought, between two of them when we did it. Like, they both came to really a lot of good stuff. Really good issues debate. But, um, you know, how are you going to get good candidates to run uh, for elections if they think it's always going to end up this way, you know? Mm. Well, you have to know that you're biting off a lot. You know that. Oh, yeah. Final thought. My, my final thought is in the Senate race that simply the big thing with Flanders was he couldn't raise enough money to be competitive. You need money. All right. So, listen, it's still Election Day next Tuesday. Uh, you know, don't rely on me to suggest it's not. It's over. It's just that. You know, you should vote for who you want to see in the seat, no matter what I say. It's just that, you know, the numbers at this level don't lie. Guys, thanks. We'll check in after the election, yep. of course. And we'll be right back with the final word. Listen, uh, on the speaker's race, we have a scheduled interview in the afternoon, meaning I've already done it, uh, with Steve Frias, uh, the opponent for Nick Mattiello. The speaker has uh, every invitation to come in here and we'll rearrange the schedule for the balance of the week for him to talk about the issues, his re-election bid, and this controversy that he's embroiled with with his rep that he just uh, reduced from chairman to everyday legislator. So we'll see how that turns out. We'll see you on the radio at 3 until 6 on WPRO. I'm back here tomorrow night. Good night. Wrapping up on the election season tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. You know, when you only do one show a night and it's only a half an hour, uh, you have a randomness sometimes to how you try to finish off the election season. Loose ends, candidates that want one more conversation, sometimes you have to say no. Uh, candidates you know you want to get in. Uh, 
zigging and zagging, taping on one day, running the show on another. And so we are seeing, you're seeing this on Friday evening. This is a show we taped on Tuesday afternoon when some serious news broke on the Speaker of the House and his handling of a situation with one of his fellow state reps on a sexual harassment claim by a fellow legislator. Uh, we're going to talk to Steve Frias here this evening. He is the uh, candidate who came this close to upending Speaker Mattiello in the 2016 District 15 Cranston race. And uh, there are a lot of feelings out there that he might be coming I don't want to jinx him, might be coming a favorite in this race just because of the way the ebb and flow has gone. I have no idea how to predict the outcome of, of the Cranston race. However, most of the pundits would say that this might be the most important race in the state. And we hope that the speaker, now follow this, I know this can be a little bit of a headache. We're taping on Tuesday, big story broke on Tuesday. We've been trying to get the speaker in one more time before the taping of the show, so I'm hoping that he had a chance to come in either Wednesday or Thursday, two days or last day ago. Um, but having said that, just scrambling to get these voices on. Uh, you'll also hear from one more gubernatorial candidate tonight. In the meantime, headline. There he is, Steve Frias. By the way, did you get all that on the schedule? Did you did you follow all that? Do you know what day today is? Today is Tuesday, right? Yes, but. We're airing on Friday. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and the election's next Tuesday. Exactly. That's the most important they, day. Oh, right. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you, Steve. Thanks for coming Thanks, in. Dan. The Republican candidate. Uh, pop up some some of these uh, these flyers. This has been. This might be the most entertaining flyer race. Kev, can we throw some of these on? Okay, so this is Nick Mattiello. Isn't it, they, the person buying the ad always looks so good, right? Mm -hmm. he's, got the, he's feeling really very summery. Yeah. And look at you. The, you disheveled. I'm working what, hard at what, the doors. What, what, you know, what are you out there? Yeah, yeah. I've seen you like that. You look like me out there in the middle of the winter <laughs> just trying to figure out what's next with a winter coat and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And, and of course, you know, we can talk about the comparisons. But then flyers like this. And by the way, this is the mild stuff. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, so this is Speaker Mattiello being uh, uh, courted by Governor Raimondo. He's been an excellent partner. I can't think of anything she's done wrong. The irony of that flyer that you put out is mm -hmm. that we both know that they'd like to rip each other's throats out. Well, well I know Well, I know they'd like to rip, rip each other's throats out, so uh, there's some humor in that one. Well, there's some, they, they have a competitive relationship. Yes. <laughs> well, by the nature of the game, the Speaker, you know, and the Governor have that kind of thing, even right. though, but the the two of them have not uh, seen eye to eye on a lot, even though they play the game pretty well. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. As a Republican who came this close last time, mm -hmm. and with the governor's polling going on right now, where she is, she's topped out at that range, uh, the height range that I predicted she would at 45%, yeah. might scooch toward 50 by the time this thing just explodes. Smart to be picking on the governor, including her as kind of a thing that chuckle about? Uh, I think the governor is unpopular in Western Cranston. Because? Uh, because she wasn't popular in 2014. I haven't seen it going door to door. I think Fung's going to win my district. I think he's going to win it by a decisive margin. Okay. And um, I don't agree with the governor. So if I don't agree with the governor, I'm not going to hide that. Uh, you think Allen will win your district handily? Well, it makes sense. It is Cranston. Yes. Uh, thought on some of the polling data that we saw released earlier in the week that has him losing ground? Um, my two thoughts are Ramundo is at about 45 and Trillo is at about 9. Fung really has to keep the Trillo and the independents below 10 to win, and he can't let Ramundo get above 45. He, he needs to do some work to bring those independents, who, undecideds over to him, and bring Trillo's numbers down. All right. Let me. Let, Highlight for me what you think are the key arguments in this race. We're going to get to the story from earlier this week because obviously you have a right to be able to speak about it. And I hope that the speaker came in to talk about it prior to the week. Again, we're taping on Tuesday. You're seeing on Friday. Other than some of that muck, mm -hmm. what do you think are the, are, are the final talking points for the voter to make a decision? Well, it's basically... Are you satisfied the way things are going in the state? Number one, I've talked to people, do you think we can survive economically being a high-tax state with a reputation for corruption? That's really what it comes down to. And the Speaker's been in power, in office for 12 years, in the leadership for about eight years, Speaker for over four and a half. He's not getting it done. 
We're still a cellar dweller when it comes to business, when it comes to taxes. And then we have all these scandals erupting around him periodically. We need to have government reforms that reduces the power of the speaker, reduces the concentration of power, and start cleaning up the state house, whether it be like line item veto, inspector general, term limits. That's really what it comes down to. We cannot keep going on the way it is, being a high-tax state with a reputation for corruption. Well, you paint him in the middle of, of scandal, and if you take a look back, he said there's been a lot of bumps in the road and associations that are not comfortable for him. But by and large, he hasn't comported himself poorly. Well, I would disagree with this aspect. He had ran a campaign that engaged in illegal activities, whether it was the fund, his PAC, which spent $72,000 illegally, whether it was the illegal coordination. I with wrote Sean the Lyman. wrong check from the wrong checkbook. That sounds like a lot of nonsense to me. You basically, you were taking money out of one account that was supposed to be for other candidates to help yourself. That's number one. And number two, the illegal coordination uh, activities with Sean Lawton. That was who things. was, who, by the way, was a fledgling Republican candidate running against you in the right. primary in 2016. I mean, I mean, yeah. you, you crushed her. Right. You know? yeah, yeah, I get that. I'm, my point is about that is that he runs a campaign that did engage in some illegal campaign finance activities, and then he has surrounds himself with people in leadership that engage in inappropriate activities. He puts them in these positions of power, and then when they go wrong, he says, I didn't know. How could I have known? And then you, 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 he does these things, and then he doesn't correct it when it does come to his attention, as we're seeing today, it appears. Mm -hmm. All right, you know what? I'm going to pause here, throw my director, Kevin, a curve, come back and talk about the story that's really hanging over the speaker's head. Stay with us. So that's WPRI headline from Tuesday of this week. This was a, a splash that the speaker did not need in this race. Again, you're watching this program on Friday. We recorded it on Tuesday. Steve Fries is my guest. You'll see him again in a moment. Uh, the speaker was dealing with an allegation uh, against uh, Representative Keeble from the northwest corner of the state. He, too, in the middle of a reelection race, uh, reportedly was, um, well, the allegation is by a young state representative that he was just harassing her in ways that have not necessarily, at the time that we did this program, uh, been on the record published and specified. Yet there's been enough background work and enough journalistic uh, evaluation to suggest that the charges were legitimate. Uh, what's troubling about this is that it, 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 it is an ongoing three and a half year saga. And within 90 minutes of this being brought to the attention of the speaker in terms of a story, he demoted Representative Keeble from the chairmanship of the Judiciary Committee. What was interesting is that Mr. Frias and Mr. Mattiello were participating in a newsmaker's debate a couple of weeks ago, and Ted Nisi asked a series of questions. Who thinks sexual harassment is a problem in the House, and if so, how have you addressed it? Well, uh, it, sexual harassment is a problem throughout society, and the House is one segment of society. We've uh, addressed it by requiring training for all of our employees, and we made the recommendation for our representatives, and that's the first way we did it. We created the commission. The bills all came in at the end. Now, as you know, I'm a pro-business speaker. That's how we've lowered our our unemployment rate from 11 to 4. We have more jobs than ever before. So you have to take a look at the impact of some of these bills. And that's what I told Representative Tanzi and everybody at the time. We will assess that, but we need a longer period of time to have conversations with folks and to see what the impact is going to be on businesses. So that process will, will start up again in January. and. We'll have conversations and we'll move the bills along as, as is appropriate at that time. As Speaker, have you ever taken any action to deal with specific sexual harassment allegations? Uh, d d d d issues come up here and there, yes, and we've, we've addressed them. Are you satisfied with how they've been addressed? I, I am. I don't think it appears that other people were. And I don't think the public is satisfied with what's going on here. When you have to fire your chairman, 90 minutes after allegations came out that you've been lingering for years, you know that you haven't handled this the right way. Yeah. Uh, and again, the speaker may have responded to this prior to the airing of this show. Um, but as we sit here on the Tuesday recording of this Friday program, 
It, it is somewhat shocking that the speaker let this thing go this long. If it wasn't, it, if it was not serious enough to respond to, why was it serious enough to respond to within 90 minutes of, of it being reported out uh, in the way that it was? Election seasons change people's behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, are you playing this hard in the district or intend to in the final weekend push? I'm going to be going door to door and be talking to people. I can't imagine people won't be talking about this. I mean, you, a sexual harassment allegation, then years of harassment. This is not some Mickey Mouse committee. The Judiciary Committee is one of the most important committees, and he chairs it. And he knew about this. He doesn't deny it. And it was serious enough to remove him already from the chairmanship. It brings in the question how the speaker handles these things. He has a history of putting these people in these positions. We have to remember one thing, though. Steve Frias is running against the speaker as a state representative, not as speaker. And so should you win on Tuesday, you'll take the speaker out of office, and there will be a new vote mm -hmm. to elect a speaker. Yes. Uh, so you'll go in as a rookie. And despite some of the warts that surround the speaker, time brings those, whether the good decisions are bad, mm -hmm. uh, the people of Cranston aren't going to benefit from his leadership thing. Your response to that to the constituents is? If you're talking about legislative grants, you're not going to be getting legislative grants from me. I don't think me. it's just uh, the grants. Uh, I don't think it's just the grants. It's the gravitas, uh, you know, and, and, and the position that he, that he holds. I think that if the people of Cranston think they've been getting good leadership from a guy who basically has been covering up someone who engages in sexual harassment, um, I don't think that's good leadership. The, I, I will tell you this, the grant thing is too funny. We didn't have time to, to put this into the show, but uh, I, I played the parts of the of the, the debate on the radio uh, after yeah. they aired. You may have heard a little bit about it. I, 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 I admire your tenacity on it. You and I have agreed on this for a long time. Mm -hmm. I, I went about seven years fighting these grants on the radio, and yeah. I just finally ran out of gas. The, the grants are the little cheesy checks for five hundred to five thousand seventy five hundred dollars that come to organizations on behalf of representatives who you think are really connected and doing a great job to get them. What they have to do to get them is, well, the leadership within both the Senate and the House would say nothing. It's just a, yeah. it's a fair determination. But the idea that the six figures in grant money that comes to the city of Cranston because the speaker is the doler outer of the money. That's correct. Uh, and you sitting there going. No grants. It's like you're the grant now. No soup for you. No soup. I'm not going to get offended that you compare me to the soup Nazi, but it's not it's, it's not what I would like to call myself. <laughs> the grant Nazi, no soup for you. Now, I'm much more of the, I'm just looking out for the taxpayers. There's money in the, you The know. culture of this place, you know what, good luck with that. And I, I, I admire your tenacity. You and I agree on this, that it's one, I think it's the, the worst corrupt program we have in the state. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll tell you, the nature of Rhode Island is they like the they like they like they like the guinea. We 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 they, have this. They think those are important programs, and they are. They we have a favor system. It's a favor factory up there at the state house, and people just want to be part of it. And I think that what we got to do is give the money back to the taxpayers and let them do what they want with it. Would you support a revised system that is much more equitable from from district to district? I mean, that so so a cause in one district, if the legislator has found favor or is making the decision, a la the speaker, uh, may be, you know, absent in another district. Same kind of an organization, same kind of cause, whether it's the little league or the food pantry or whatever it is, and they don't get anything because they weren't in the right place. Yeah, is, is there a way to equitize? Is that a word uh, or equalize this whole thing? And maybe there is, but it has to be transparent. It has to be debated as part of the budget. It can't be like one guy sitting on the third floor making decisions on you've been nice to me, you've been naughty to me, and you get some money and you get nothing. It can't be that anymore. Right, final thought on why you uh, should be elected. Tuesday. Because we got to do something about this state's direction. We cannot continue to be a high-tax state with a reputation for corruption. You vote for the speaker, you're going to get more of that. If you vote for me, maybe we can change that. All right, you lost by 87 ballots last time. The, the uh, mail ballot was pretty prominent. I'm not so sure the speaker's got that artillery this time around. You confident? I'm pretty confident, sir. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you. All right, when we come back, I don't know where I am. When we come back, one more gubernatorial candidate. Stay with us. So there was the uh, opening, uh, at least attention, headline for Dr. Luis Daniel Munoz, who is a candidate for governor 
And uh, he's a perfect gentleman, a nice guy. He's been here before. Uh, I don't need to talk about you. I'll talk to you. Uh, you're, you're sitting here with polling data that says you and a group of folks are, are, are arguing for 4% the last crumbs in this, in this race. So why are you still doing this? I understand what the polling data is saying, um, but I also understand the voter turnout is not, um, we haven't maximized it in the state. Not many people turn out, right? Overall, it's less than 50% of Rhode Islanders that end up coming out for the general election. Uh, so my, uh, I would say, duty as a leader and someone seeking leadership has been to try to empower voters with an understanding that they have an option, an option that involves a candidate that's presenting pragmatic solutions around health care, education, and specific taxes that would uh, relieve, you know, relieve the burden of taxation on our small businesses. So I understand what the polls are saying, but I also believe that they're working within a small pool of voters that tend to turn out, which is great, but what I'm trying to do is empower voters that normally don't come out to vote to see that they have an option. Yes, yeah, so do you get the names of maybe 150,000 people that aren't <laughs> poldable that you can bring out to, to vote here? Right? Well, we did, a, we, we did what we call, a, it's entitled a persuadability analysis, but what it really focuses on, it, it looks at towns and cities that vote on the basis of ideas. And the way that you analyze that is a town and city may one time waver more heavily in electing Republicans and other cycle uh, Democrats. And what that shows is that the residents in those towns and cities are looking for ideas that will create some positive impact on their lives, and that's what they're voting for. Uh, so what we've done over the last nine months is really spend time with many of the residents throughout the state, but we have focused heavily on towns and, and cities that have demonstrated that they're looking for candidates with pragmatic solutions. All right, listen, you're, uh, you, we've, we've done your story before. You can go on to foxprovince.com, just look up our guest and, and hear his life story. But uh, the 30-second summation so that we can get to some issues is that um, you're in the medical field. You, you call yourself doctor because you have a degree, but you're not a licensed practitioner in the state, correct? I don't consider myself a physician. I don't practice medicine every day, so I'm a medical doctor. Right, and, you, right. and you're an entrepreneur. Correct. Running a business designed to do what? Well, the business, it's moved on to the technical partners, uh, but what we did was essentially create a laser-based tissue scanner. So it was helping diabetic patients assess uh, wounds. Did you sell it? Did you sell the business? So we partnered with larger companies. Okay. So the partnership, uh, you arranged you know, deals in terms of successes and milestones, so that's, that's a whole other business discussion. So you earn a living doing what? Consultation. Uh, help hospital systems that want to adopt technologies that would make healthcare more affordable and accessible. Uh, essentially help them understand which technologies are key and how to implement them into their infrastructure, which at times can be one of the most rigid infrastructures. So the key issues for you are? Healthcare, uh, specific investments around community health to make mental health uh, more accessible and affordable. Uh, also confronting the monopoly on health insurance that we have in the state, either by placing government at the negotiation table between insurers and hospitals where those decisions are made, or opening up our borders to additional insurance companies, which may be radical but necessary to stabilize health insurance premiums. Around education, I think we should think outside the box. We have a lot of institutions that don't pay taxes, like Brown University, they do payments in lieu of taxes. And if we can uh, work with those institutions to provide us with additional services around after school programs, I think that we can make vocational training universal for all public high school students. Sometimes fledgling candidates in a race actually have some of the brightest ideas. Um, I don't know, haven't been able to study enough of what you and I have discussed and what you've written about, other than to just kind of digest it and say, hmm, okay, got a point. Uh, have you been able to mix with either of the two leading candidates in your travels to sell them on the idea that what you're bringing to the table on an issue basis is transferable to their leadership? In other words, is it, have they, either one of them said, hey, you want to come talk to me about this stuff? No invitations to talk. With that said, I've been running a, a campaign for nine months. There have been collisions uh, with other campaigns. Uh, Mr. Uh, Fung has certainly acknowledged on WPRO that he has seen me at uh, all of the different events he has been to. Recently, we ran into each other at North Kingston High School, and he had some positive things to say about my health care uh, plan or approach. Uh, with that said, I've also been assessing their platforms and what they're saying, and unfortunately, I haven't heard anything around healthcare or any out-of-the-box solutions you don't around think education. You don't think their approaches match up? I don't believe that they have a priority to uh, edify Rhode Islanders around healthcare and education, and you know, I truly believe that that's the vehicle to building an economy. Well, when it comes to healthcare right now, Gina just wants to get the computer to work. You know, the UHIP debacle, as it's known. Uh, you know, moves into the health exchange. The health exchange is reliant on the computer to work. And so right now, rather than content and, and 
real treatment issues. They're just trying to get everyone to connect right. So right, but they're around, stunted right now. Un unfortunately, that's true. But a lot of what I bring to the table is that combination of healthcare as well as an understanding of technology. And around Deloitte and just the whole UHIP challenge, we we need to do more than just attempting to salvage the technology. I think we need a full out investigation into whether there were guarantees in the contract, and if not, there are other out of the box solutions that right. we can leverage. Uh, you present well. You're articulate. Thank you're a you, young sir. guy. Are you just trying to set the table for future? runs, this is a one-time shot, or are you in this for the long haul? I want to contribute uh, to positive solutions in life and in, in the community and in the state of Rhode Island. I don't want to say that this is a platform for another race because I, I don't want to allow my ego to take over the reason I'm running, and I'm running for Rhode Islanders. So what I've said to uh, voters that I've engaged uh, along the path is, if you want change, vote for it this time. I'm the fifth name on the ballot. Very polished answer. Now tell me, are you done running after this election? Yes or no? So this election is... You wanted I'll me to just through. take that for, for a face value. No, I mean, and I appreciate, I appreciate I'll see very through. deft and, I'll see and diplomatic approach, <laughs> but you're not going to win this race. We know that. So it doesn't mean that you haven't said some really smart things that will be picked up and that you can lay the groundwork and the foundation uh, for the future. But the last, I, I, the I last time there was a six-way ballot, the What's last that? time there was a six-way ballot, an independent won, and he beat a well-liked Democrat uh, by the name of Frank Caprio. Uh, so there is a possibility, and however much the polls do show that that possibility for the existing voters that do turn on the general election may be low, uh, again, I believe that if I've done uh, my job in empowering voters to understand that they have an option, that we can have a surprise next Tuesday. All right. So we'll, uh, we'll respect that hypothesis. Ten Thank seconds you. on why you ought to be elected. I, uh, Rhode Islanders need help. Uh, Rhode Islanders need affordable, accessible, high-quality health care, and the only way to do that is to invest in community health. The only way to do that is to stabilize health insurance premiums by opening up our borders. The only way to edify our people is to provide vocational training for our youth and a civic service program that can mitigate the youth violence that we're seeing across the state. There are ways to create local economies and strengthen them, and that's by edifying people, and I'm the candidate that's focused on doing that. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Final word, and we come back. Stay with us. Most likely that wraps up our conversations about the Tuesday election. Now look, if you're informed, get out and vote. If you're not informed, well, you know, uh, we'll touch base on a couple of our thoughts about the election on Monday. We'll most likely uh, visit the, uh, the conversation about Pittsburgh and the vigil earlier this week, which was very touching, very poignant, very solemn, and just devastatingly sad. What a world, right? We'll see you on the radio as well at 3 until 6 on WPRO. Have a great weekend. Good night.